This DVD is a sketch of the life history of John Baptist Ripplinger and Louise Butler. It was made in July 2014 by Asa J. Drake and Stephen Drake, a grandson and great-grandson, from written histories and family photos. The DVD is made for the Ripplinger reunion, hosted by the family of John and Louise's daughter Gertrude, who married Asa M. B. Drake. If we don't document history, it will be lost. We as progeny have been blessed far beyond our comprehension because of the decisions made long ago by our forebears. When grandfather is listed on the passenger list of the Nevada, it is written with two P's. This is not meant to be an all-inclusive history of both John and Louise. Both have more complete written histories because this is produced by descendants of Gertrude, who rarely spoke of her father. We will focus more on John. In French, his first name is Jean. In German, it's Johann. And in English, it's John. Since this record is in English, we will call him John. We have not determined when Ripplingers began to spell with two P's. At the time John Baptist Ripplinger was born, names were spelled according to how the clerk or recorder hears the name and spells it. Most people at that time did not know how to spell or write their names, so it depended on the clerk how it was spelled. Thus, the name has been spelled Ribplinger, R-E-I-P-P-L, R-U-P-L, R-E-P-L, R-O-U-P-L, R-O-P-P-L, and so forth. Family tradition says John Baptist Ripplinger was born in Alsace-Lorraine, but doesn't designate France or Germany. Cecil Ripplinger found the birth record of grandfather which states, in Paris, France. His name is recorded as Jean-Baptiste Ripplinger, born 30 October 1860 at 10. No a.m. or p.m. is recorded. On July 18, 1930, the family had a reunion and asked Grandmother Louise to give a history of their father. And this is what she mentioned. Today we, the children and grandchildren of John Baptist Ripplinger, have met for the purpose to celebrate our first family reunion and to get closer acquainted with one another. I shall attempt to give a brief history of your father and grandfather, John B. Ripplinger, born in Paris, France, October 30, 1860, and his sons and daughters. When about seven years old, his parents died. The two children, your father and his brother Nicholas, were brought to their uncle Nicholas, Gilbert Knocker, in Barrington, Lorraine, Germany, where they remained until they were grown when his uncle, who was a tailor, taught him the same vocation, while his younger brother was educated to become a teacher. After some years, uncle sent your father, then a young man, out into the world among strangers to acquire more knowledge in the trade of a tailor. In his wanderings, he came to Switzerland, where he heard the gospel for the first time. He was raised in faith of the Catholic Church. In his travels, he attended several Protestant churches, but when he heard the Mormon elders preach the plan of salvation, he was attracted by their simplicity and sincerity and began to attend the meetings of the Latter-day Saints. To receive more light and information, he even traveled to Bern, where the mission office was located. He became convinced it was the gospel of Jesus Christ and was baptized into the church on 9 June 1885, becoming a diligent member. His vocation took him to Geneva and Beale, where he and an elder called at our home. About that time, my own father became interested in the Mormon doctrine, and both attended the Latter-day Saint meetings on Sundays, walking 10 to 15 miles to hear the elders preach the gospel of repentance. By and by, I also got attracted by this new doctrine, as the elders became frequent and welcome guests in our home. After sincere investigation and fervent prayer, I too received a testimony of the true gospel and was baptized 
on November 15, 1885. Soon the desire of gathering with the Latter-day Saints in Zion was felt by both of us, which came to pass in June of 1888. We made the trip together with a small company of saints crossing the ocean in the ship Nevada. For ten months we stayed in Salt Lake City, where your father was employed in a tailor shop, while I worked for a Jewish family. In 1889 we were married in the Logan Temple on May 1st, and for a month did the work for a number of our relatives therein. From here we went to Rexburg, Idaho, where your father bought a two and a half acre lot with a good si room, two roomed house on it. In November we left for a time and went to Eagle Rock, now Idaho Falls, to find work with a tailor. <clears throat> there in March 16, 1890, Richard was born. The following year in April we returned to Rexburg, where on May 25th Martha was born. Here your father set up his own tailor shop and in the fall we moved into the rear part of the building to be closer to town. Then your father became prosperous and sent for another tailor, a friend of his. On October 20th of 92 Henry, our third child, was born and we felt the necessity to move back to our original home out of town which was nicely remodeled and the tailor with his wife moved into the vacated room. The coming fall November 7th of 93, Carl was born. Not long after, your father received a call to fulfill a mission in the Netherlands and Belgium. He left in the fall of 1894, was on his mission 35 months, returning home October 12, 1897. Two more sons, Lawrence and Warner, were added to our union. In the fall of 1900, father sold our home in Rexburg and made arrangements for us to move to St. Anthony where he had already opened a tailor shop. Here Gertrude, Leah and Bertha were born which made all of our nine children. Shortly after our last child was born we were visited by some of the leading elders of Teton Valley, Brother George Young, Harold Winger and Stanley Fairbanks who persuaded us to move up there as they thought it was a good place to raise a big family. We actually moved to Driggs, arriving June 4, 1906, being three days on our way. The first winter we lived in Driggs for the children had need to attend school, and there were greater opportunities and facilities in town than in the rural district. On March of the following spring we moved over to Bates on a farm which we had purchased from Harold Winger in exchange for our home in St. Anthony. Just after the deal was made we learned much to our sorrow that it was government land and we had to file on and go through all the requirements of government land to new settlers. As a result of this misfortune father deserted his family leaving first for St. Anthony where he had good employment at the, in the St. Industrial School teaching boys the trade of a tailor. Leaving St. Anthony he led a transient life returning from time to time for brief visits. Many of us will find it interesting to know how Grandpa and Grandma Ripplinger came from Switzerland to Teton Valley. While Grandpa Ripplinger doesn't give details of their journey, Grandma Ripplinger does. She relates that it was a tearful goodbye by her father in Beale on their way to Basel where they would meet other saints on their way to America as well. The next day to Rotterdam, then across the North Sea to Hull on their way to Liverpool. Each day, Grandma Ripplinger relates that she mailed a card back home to share the events of the day and the beautiful scenery they enjoyed. Once in Liverpool, she described that the following morning they boarded the ship Nevada on their transatlantic voyage to New York. It's worth noting that the rough seas did not agree with them. In fact, Grandma Ripplinger describes that for eight days and nights she couldn't move, eat, or sleep. Once carried to another cabin, she began to improve and before long was singing the songs of Zion with the other saints. She also shares a sobering event when she remained on deck after dinner one evening when she saw four sailors bring a corpse wrapped in burlap sackcloth up. There the captain of the Nevada read from the New Testament and the body was buried at sea, all of which was customary with those who die while on the ocean. Finally, twelve days later, they landed in New York, boarded a smaller vessel to Norfolk, Virginia, 
From here they would journey west by train. We soon found ourselves speeding through the Appalachian mountain range with its beautiful changing mountain scenery. After leaving the mountains we passed through fertile forests over trestle work into the lowlands of the Mississippi River. Once across the great Mississippi River, she further continues, we saw prairies, desert, and more forests where we picked huckleberries along the track while the engine was supplied with water. As we neared Denver, the landscape changed. The rivers with their clear water looked more familiar to us. From Denver, another train took them to Green River and Cheyenne, Wyoming, finally arriving in Salt Lake City, Utah. It wasn't until nearly a year after arriving in Salt Lake City and marrying Grandpa Ripplinger that they came to Rexburg and eventually Teton Valley, but not before Grandpa's mission to the Netherlands and Belgium and nearly six years in St. Anthony, Idaho. That's all that grandmother gave that day. The rest is things which uh, we have uh, made comments on. Perhaps if the family had stayed in Driggs to, have, uh, to live where grandfather could have found work, his future may have been different. Lawrence tells how his father would come in from milking the cow on a cold morning. He was cold and smelled like cow. Why do this when he could make a good living as a tailor? He was no farmer and he hated being on the farm. Just when grandfather left his family for good, and what the cause and circumstances are is not for our generation to say. We know he sent food and money to his family from time to time, and he came to visit with them. Mr. Winger had gone through the pretense of selling them their farm and had grandfather sign the papers for his house in St. Anthony in exchange. Grandfather had actually filed homestead rights on the farm. When friends and neighbors heard of this, they raised their voices in protest until they were finally able to secure from Mr. Winger three lots in Driggs, but they had to take it to a church court. Grandmother's history states, quote, as a result of this misfortune, Brother Replinger deserted his family, unquote. Her history also said, Due to the fact that the land was taken up by him, he felt that he had a right to do with it as he chose. So to protect ourselves, I found it necessary to take a divorce, which I got June 27, 1914. Grandfather must have uh, visited from time to time. When Louise was born in 1929, Grandfather was at the house while Asa and Gertrude went to Rexburg. Upon their return, Asa tells how Grandfather handed the baby back to them with a saying that is often quoted in Gertrude's family. He handed the baby back and said, Youth is a fine time for these things. Gertrude graduated from high school in 1922. She was walking down the street in Driggs and saw her father coming toward her. She crossed the street to get away from him, but he crossed and greeted her. He said he wanted to give her a graduation gift and to reward her for her efforts in music. He gave her a gold lady's wristwatch, which she wore for many years. It has been passed down to the girls, and Deanne has the watch on display today. Being a tailor, there were many scraps and swatches, and so Grandmother would save the fabric swatches of velvet and wool, crochet around each and then crochet them together. Gertrude remembers gathering wool for the batting off from the barbed wire fences on the way home from school. This was carded and, and the completed quilt was given to my mother as a wedding gift in 1927. The crib quilt top is original. Family members replaced the batting and the final black backing in the full quilt in 1978 and Deanne has this on display today.
We'll close with two poems given by Warner. Exiled. But does anyone forget how to assess these gleaming frontiers while the mind lies fallow? These broad smiling fields are now green with our morrow's nourishment. Against them we pitted our generation's strength as we walked harnessed in the damp brown furrow. In May we planted our prayers, a litany of hope deferred. In October our reckoning was in red ink. Meadow larks trilled their intricate notes were our threatening of privation. The bitterns booming, a bassoon pressed to our lips. From the cattle and horses we learned sex. When the purple congregation of clouds, like collapsing umbrellas, burst upon us, when thunder rattled in our throats, and zigzag lightning split our hearts, we remained inescapably rooted to the soil. Winter's white clenched fist straightened our fingers into icicle spears, while under ten-foot snowdrifts we tunneled silent paths to watering places. Our eyelids were pressed into round, bitter tears, straining against encircling mountains. Only in the season when red huckleberries stained our hungry mouths did we forget restricting horizons. How swiftly our youth flashed by in the upward leap of the river trout. Scarred with alkali, strangled with sagebrush, quivering flesh raw with primitive lacerations, with pulses quickened and breath hot with adventure, we at last broke down a hymn of freedom. But still not erased from the land, we are the harvest, stooping for winter. Warner Ripplinger You could pray in English, German, French. In your craft, the best. Why did you fail? You deserted both your home and your tailor's bench, where flesh and restless spirit much too frail? Once, tipsy, you found your way to my small school, and I was cut in two, a shame-faced lad, who saw a stranger acting like a fool. And yet I long to claim you as my dad. Your birthday gift is stitched in living thread. The debt I owe you memories away. I scan your life so grievously misread. If only I could speak to you today. Throw wide the curtains, let in the light. In this broken circle your halo does not shine. But yonder, where you disappear from sight, I swear your clothes are cut the same as mine. Life struggle made each mem family member strong. And so, Grandfather, whatever your strengths or failings, you and Grandmother Ripplinger have given us a wonderful heritage. Members of your family often felt poor and li of little worth, but each family member became clearly successful in their own way. Thank you. Thank you.